Welcome and good afternoon, everybody. You've been listening to Shlomo Artsy's La Tate Villa Kachat, to give and to take. And the song and its lyrics are quite suitable, in my humble opinion, for today. Um, he says, I learned how to fly, but not to fall. And we all need our own word, our own thought, a place to know. Not to be afraid of the fear. Friends, we are in uh, some unprecedented, frightening times. There have been more Israelis, more Jews killed on any day at any one time since this past Saturday than any single day since the Holocaust. The death toll is well over 1,200 and unfortunately rising. A toll that includes not just soldiers, but civilians of all ages, as you know, women, the elderly, children, and yes, babies uh, butchered, and as we now understand, uh, uh, even beheaded. There are thousands more wounded, and of course there are 125, 150, maybe more hostages being held by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The death toll is the equivalent of over 30,000 Americans being killed on 9-11, 30,000 Americans being killed on 9-11. And so before we dive in, and we have a lot to cover, let that all sink in as we share a moment of silence in memory of all of those lost and in honor of all those captive yet to be redeemed and everyone in pain and suffering. Okay, my name is Danny Schultz, and on behalf of the Westchester Jewish Council, I am honored to be hosting today's event, part of the WJC successful Israel Connection Series. The WJC is an umbrella organization representing 135 Jewish groups, schools, and synagogues in Westchester, the eighth largest Jewish community in the United States. I would say probably the largest non-urban Jewish community in the United States overall. As you know, we've been hit with an unthinkable tragedy of barbaric act. Unmute yourself, Danny. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? We have with us as I said, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, some very excellent people. Uh, Join the friend, meeting. My good friend, retired U.S. Army Major Mike Lyons. Mike has been serving this country, the United States, for 20 years in both active and reserve duty, including Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and is a Bronze Star recipient. And Mike, we thank you for your service. In addition, Mike is a frequent contributor to CNN and other outlets. In fact, if you've been watching, Debbie CNN, Shrag. you would have seen him today, yesterday, tomorrow, and he is also a lecturer at West Point. We also have with us Join the meeting. retired Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi, a 15-year veteran of Israel Defense Forces with experience in military intelligence and the founder of ALMA, Strategic Research Institute, located near and focused on Israel's northern border on strategic issues. The rookie with us today is Dr. Shlomi Kodesh. Dr. Kodesh, we are honored to have you. Thank you. He has been the Director General of Soroka Medical Center in Beersheba, a key medical center in everything we will discuss since 2018. He's a master's in public health, graduate of Ben Gurion University Medical School. He completed his residency at Soroka Medical Center, a postdoctoral fellowship 
in medical informatics at Yale University, and he has a master's degree in public health. And with us as well, hopefully joining us as well, uh, Mike Wagenheim, senior U.S. correspondent for I-24 News. Mike's covered the Knesset, the prime minister's office, the White House, U.S. elections, Israeli elections, and all other topics in between. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Uh, the other day, I heard the deputy mayor of Jerusalem, uh, Flur Hassan Nahum, say that we are in a civilizational war. And just with a little historical perspective for, for uh, some of you, we, Israel, left Gaza, I believe around 2005, evacuating 7,000 settlements for Gaza to become autonomous. Now, fast forward, we're in day five of this great tragedy. And um, I'm going to start, Mike, with you. I'm going to pull up uh, some maps and... Uh, Let's see if I can make our systems work here. Hang on. There we go. And okay. So, Mike, um, look, you've been on um, uh, CNN a lot. I've heard you address this. Um, you know, I, I want to ask you, first of all, as a military man, as somebody who served um, in the line of duty, what just just give us for a moment, what are your first impressions from Saturday morning to today that you can share with us? So, Danny, thanks so much for having me and to talk to this esteemed group. I've, I've had the privilege to talk to you guys before. Um, I, you know, from a op, I'm an ops guy and um, from an operational perspective, the enemy did, you know, a hundred things right, and unfortunately, on the Israeli side, um, there were mistakes that were made. There's, I'm sure, there'll be an investigation and the like, but um, the 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 fact of the matter was that, uh, you know, if if the regular systems were working and in place, we wouldn't have seen something like this. But it did happen. It was well planned. What they did on their their side, it was well planned. It was um, and executed almost perfectly. Um, and what they've done. Uh, it starts something that uh, I'm not sure how they thought it was going to finish, but we're, we're going to obviously you know, soon find out. As you look at this map here, um, all these areas along the, the 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 border there in Gaza, it's a very short strip, right? Everyone understands it's about 25 miles wide, about seven miles long, or 25 miles long, seven miles wide, very short, uh, right across the border. Um, using aero gliders, tunnels, all, all of the things came through the the wall in, in certain areas there, and brought enough of a force um, to go along with that the music festival that was also part of this, and into those towns and villages that were there along the place, and then claimed hostages went back uh, on the other side to hide out. Um, I've been focused in the last few days in in the north in in Sidrot. Uh, as well as in Ashkelon uh, with with CNN forces that are there, and then also in in Berari. Um, only because we're there with the media there, you're seeing this, the tragedies of what what was left behind and 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 the and the savagery of what this enemy did uh, and what they've caused, and I think what's caused it to escalate so far. So it's really not even a military attack; it's more of a terrorist attack. It's there's so many 9/11 analogies that you can think of. Uh, and um, and now you know Israel is responding like they should. Danny, unmute yourself. Danny, we can't hear you. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't hear you. Can't hear you. You there, Danny? Yeah, he's still muted. There we go. Right. Unmuted? Unmuted. Yeah. They wouldn't let me unmute for some reason. Um, all right. So um, before we go to to, um, to the broader map, Mike, I got a question for you, which is, you know, if you're in the room where strategy is being discussed, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are you now most focused on? Right. We're five days in. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's an operation, as you said, you're an ops guy, there's an operation to, right. uh, discuss and, and prepare for and execute, uh, 
you know, talk us through that. What goes through your mind if you're the guy in the room right now? So two things. I heard my prime minister say we're at war, and I heard him say we're going to lay siege to uh, to Gaza. And so from a military perspective, that has two specific meetings. Um, we've called up 300,000 reservists, but I would also tell Mr. Prime Minister that now that we're at war, others will be at war with us. And this is something that we've got to take into consideration. Um, we'll have to control emotion and not act because we, we need to do this on our terms. We need to not uh, just launch and, and try, try something that uh, in, as an act of revenge uh, because this is now going to become a very long in the term process. I would be very concerned about what's going on in the north. Our, our enemies could take advantage of us uh, there if they feel that we are overcommitted to the south. We would not ever want to leave an open highway for they for them to get to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or any other place. We have to also look at the West Bank and see what is going on there. So we're going to have to make sure we divide our forces to recognize we're at war. We know where the main effort is. Obviously, it's here in Gaza. However, um, we, we need to recognize that uh, that this is going to be something that's going to be more of a campaign, uh, and we're going to need to get help. We're going to need to get support from our allies. We have to find allies both in the region and then our friends abroad. Okay, so maybe we'll come back. Michelle I just want to get your join the meeting. On the 300,000. Uh, I mean, the... Danny, I just want to interrupt. I'm sorry, uh, but Mike Wagenheim is in the room. Oh, fantastic, Mike. Thank you for okay. joining um, I think maybe, Mike, we may need you to mute or if we could mute. Oh, there we go. Okay. okay he's... Uh, so, uh, Mike Lyons, um, uh, I hear you. Uh, 300,000. Can you give us an idea? Uh, if you've got 300,000 troops, how I don't believe those are all to be deployed down south. No, uh, here's what so I here would be my my recommendation to the prime minister and something like this. Uh, the Israel, Israel Defense Forces has about 170,000 active duty forces uh, on ready to go. And that's got to be the tip of the spear in this. I think you're looking at at least 100,000 troops would get deployed to the south uh, only because there's two options down here. There's there's no question what the outcome will be in Gaza. There's no question that uh, that uh, Hamas will be routed. There's no question that'll be the case. The question is, do we have to garrison troops there? Will we have to keep troops there? What do we have to do? Then you take the other 70,000, they get deployed to the north. And then as reservists come on board, um, I think the focus has got to be you know where the priority then is at the time. But in most cases, uh, let's see what the active duty force does with the situation in in the south. Bring the rever reservists on, knowing full well that they could be on active duty for a year, year or more, in order to to see this whole thing through. Right, right. And you know, back in May of 2022, you and I were speaking about Ukraine in this same forum, uh, mm -hmm. and I asked you about drones on the battlefield. Of course, we now know that drones uh, were helped to break through in the south uh, and are being used up north now, we believe, and we'll get more on this maybe from you, Sarit, but what, what are the drones actually capable of? You know, these are not little toys. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to that for a minute? Sure. Some of them have come from Iran. They're going to um, pose a threat to the Israeli forces as they uh, enter into the Gaza Strip. They're going to pose a, a threat to the mechan the, the mechanized what forces. Fire, what are they firing though? Just so everybody understands, and I and I don't understand. What no, are they they're they're mo they're suicide drones. They're not they don't have this capability. Um, but they they collect intel. They they do they do uh, those kinds of things. But they're designed to to give up. Uh, but they but again, they're they're for troops in the open and the like. That's where they're they're going to cause the problems. But. But we also know Hamas has got anti-tank rounds. They know they have more sophisticated capability than, than they've had in the past. They also know that if they've planned for this offensive operation, they've planned for the defense. So, so, so that's why any any offensive operation before it starts has to be very specific, deliberate, with well rehearsed. They have to figure out how we're going to accomplish, uh, you know, the objectives in these kinds of areas. Right. Okay. Understood. And. Um... I'm going to pull up another map here for a second. Uh, I want to get your take on this. I'm putting you in charge here of everything. Um, so um, 
it is a little bit more detail and um you know you can see here where ray em is the sort of one two third blue bubble down which is where the the music festival was um you know it's a little bit small type but my question to you is if you look up at the Erez crossing mike is uh if you were going to you know if you're going to be in charge and execute this attack in gaza are you coming through the Erez crossing is that the only way to do this uh, uh i would think not but i don't know um so it's a sort of a broad question but where 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 do you start so I think at the last time when Israel did this, 2014, they, they had three primary axes of approach, and that was first in the Aras Crossing in the north, and then about halfway down, I uh, don't see the name of the city, I, I believe it's um, it was a little halfway down further to the Strip, and then they had, they had one last unit in the south on the border with Egypt, mm -hmm. um, and that's potentially to a classic divide and conquer. Now, I, I don't perceive... You know Hamas to be in in any one location, given what they've done so far. There, you could see from this map how densely populated the the area is. Think, you know, concrete jungle. Some of you have already been there, so it's a very difficult military mission from an urban perspective to do uh, this kind of military operation, um, which is why protection of the force I think will be the primary objective as well. Uh, I think commanders will only take on this mission knowing that they're not going to uh, take large casualties. So you're going to see a lot of softening up of these defenses, a lot of artillery. If you're watching CNN right now, you're seeing the, the Iron Dome system in place because you're hearing the artillery in the background. I can hear that 155 Israeli artillery firing back. There's, there's going to be a tremendous softening of these positions before any offensive operation takes place. And let me ask you, and I want to keep moving through this, but, you know, uh, as I said, you're in charge. You have to execute an attack that has the complication, of course, of, uh, you know, hostages likely spread throughout Gaza um, at the same time as the stated goal of the state of Israel putting Hamas out of business. Um, I know there are some rumored reports right now of, of um uh, potentially negotiating to have uh, you know women and children uh, evacuated that could be you know wishful thinking but all that aside how do you do any of this um and uh, would Hamas be likely to want to hold these hostages in any event uh as their last bargaining chip I think they're going to hold them as their last bargaining trip and as fortunately as time has gone on there's more as it as it happens, uh, they've got more opportunity to to you know hide them deeper inside that territory, and it's unfortunate, but that's the harsh reality of the situation. I am sure that um, every Israeli um, special operator right now has cleared their desk, and there's probably if there's 150 hostages, there's 150 separate task force ready to find as many as they can, trying to get human intelligence right now. Uh, you know, Israel did have human intent, in, in, intel inside this, the, inside the Gaza Strip. And so finding out where these hostages are and if they can execute a fast rope helicopter mission, I'm sure they will. It's going to be very risky. It's going to be um, something that I'm sure they're going to have to weigh whether they put the rescuers at risk as well. Right. OK, thank you. So, Mike, one more question before we turn to the north, uh, Sarit, is um... – how long does this take? And, you know, what's the casualty list? I think I think time is going to be on the side of Israel here. And um, there sh they shouldn't be rushed into a fast operation uh, for the sake of uh, you know, revenge and, and the like. Uh, in Desert Storm, we uh, the Air Force pounded away for 35 days. I know that's a long time, but that would give the most element of surprise when the time comes. Uh, they've got to be make sure that this these defenses are very soft. They're not. They've not been softened up enough. Day. The, the the bottom line is Hamas is still firing rockets today, right. so they have capacity still. I, I I would like to see all that capacity completely exhausted, uh, and and make it as easy as possible. The question is whether or not Israel as a country can hold on for thirty days and put up with this, not getting the result that they want to get. Right. Understood. Understood. Um... And, and you made a great point. I, I heard Ehud Barak uh, uh, on a bro some broadcast the other day saying uh, that he's always felt that boiling blood is not a good recipe for making strategic decisions. Anger must give way to cool, calculated thinking. So it, yep. it seems hopefully that that's the case. Um, 
Sarit, Lieutenant Colonel Zahavi, uh, everybody, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but you're the elephant in the room. Everybody wants to know what is going on up north. What can you tell us? The last time we spoke was May 2021. And, um, you know, other than what's changed in the last five days, is there anything that's changed in the last 24 months? What can you tell us? I just want to start from uh, describing you my afternoon. I'm speaking to you from a shelter. I am uh, based uh, here, I don't know, 12, uh, maybe 13 kilometers from the Israel-Lebanese border. Uh, I was walking, my office is just upstairs. I was walking uh, at the office and I was about to go on Zoom to participate in a conference in the uh, European Parliament in Brussels, which I was supposed to be in Brussels and eating the chocolate, but I'm here. And they brought me on Zoom. And the moment I pressed join Zoom, I hear the alerts. I switch off the Zoom, we run to the shelter, and then I switch it on again. And then we hear another alert. And everything here went crazy. And we don't know, you know, until now, it looks like it was false alerts. But uh, the tension is extremely high. And we are after a few days that uh, the northern border is not quiet. In, in regular times, things that happened here in the northern border in the past few days would lead to war in the northern border. Mm. Because we had anti-tank launching here against IDF vehicles and positions, which I don't know yet uh, about casualties. Uh, IDF uh, didn't publish yet. Uh, we had an infiltration of terrorists that killed two IDF soldiers. One of them is a senior officer, the deputy commander of the brigade, mm. and uh, his driver. Both of them are Druze from towns next to where I live. Uh, they killed the two terrorists, and the third one uh, fled back to Lebanon. We had rockets launching. In the Western Galley, not far from where I live, uh, five minutes from home, there were alerts everywhere. And luckily, Iron Dome intercepted the uh, 10 rockets, and five rockets fell in open area. And, and there were more anti tank launching that uh, in the past few days, other than the one this morning. So I heard a couple of hours ago, and I and so I want to ask you again, uh, just to make sure it's clear for everybody else. Uh, I did hear a couple of hours ago that. Um, there was some infiltration, there were some drones and possibly paragliders, but that could all be not at all accurate. It, the, the spokesperson of the IDF yeah. went uh, to a press conference and uh, clarified the situation and said that nothing penetrated to Israel and it was false alarm. But uh, what can I tell? Uh, false alarm once false alarm twice. We had like four times alarms, right? Uh, which were all false alarms within an hour. All right. So uh, other than false uh, alarms, then what can you tell us? And maybe just as, as background, um, uh, maybe you can just characterize for everybody the distinction between, uh, uh, if you can, uh, Lebanon and the sort of non-nation state control, Mike, I think that's a phrase that you used earlier today on, on TV, the non-nation state nature of the control that Hezbollah has uh, in Southern Lebanon. Um, One minute. Sure. I just want to finish the situation here. I'm sorry. Uh, the IDF is completely prepared for war. It will come from the North, uh, whether Syria or Lebanon. So big part of the 360,000 that were uh, drafted, the reserves that were drafted are positioned here. We saw the tanks and armored and uh, all the time, all the time we see here forces going up to the border. And uh, we hear all the time the security aircrafts in the sky. Uh, it's it's war, It's a, it, the feeling is that we are living in a war zone, even though it's not the catastrophe that we had in Gaza. Right. In Gaza. Right. So your question. Um, and by the way, before you even hit, uh, touch on my question, if you've got uh, a map that uh, that covers uh, the area, you're more than welcome to, to pull that up because um, we're still looking at the 
uh, Hamas rocket fire into central Israel. <laughs> okay, so if you just uh, we'll give we'll give you give the, me a minute the, because the it's uh, screen was full screen. Sure, sure. And it looks like we lost Mike, uh, but hopefully he'll Mike Wagenheim, but hopefully he'll be back uh, so we can ask him about the unity government. Um, I just prepared other maps, but uh, oh, whatever, uh, whatever you see fit. You're the lieutenant colonel. I, just... it's, it's okay. You are right. You should see a map of the region, and even a map that will present. But what we're now seeing Danny's map. Yes, Sarita's going to take over. I think. Okay, so do you have to unshare? Oh. Okay. I, I, I try to pick a, a relatively simple map. Let's see, how do I share? And I believe Mac, Mike Wagenheim is still there, Danny. Oh, okay, good. He's still on, yeah. Still so, on. can you ah. see my clicker? Yes, fantastic, thank you. Okay, this map is actually the map of the excuses for war with Lebanon or with Hezbollah. Because all the red lines in this map are what uh, it called the areas of reservations. Areas that, though Israel had withdrawn completely from Lebanon and the United Nations uh, recognized that in 2000, the Lebanese said these areas in red, the border was not marked uh, as the Lebanese believe it should be. And these are uh, area disputed areas. Uh, the area here is Shiva Farms, which is an area that was taken from Syria and uh, the Lebanese claim it's theirs. And that's why for them, this is also an occupied area. And the first launching of anti-tank missiles, the first incident that started here was to this area against an IDF position. By the way, a launching that happened from a school. Hmm. Uh, they launched from a school in the Join the meeting. Uh, I live uh, somewhere now to take this off. I live somewhere over here. That's, that was going to be the next question. Thank you. <laughs> so I live somewhere over here, and the infiltration, the rocket launching, the anti-tank this morning all happened in this area uh, over here, within the, the western area. Now, why am I mentioning all of that? You ask me about what's the change, what changed in the past two years, right? Yes. Yes. And I said Adam there was a huge off. change in the past Join the meeting. Years. What I can say is that in the past two years, Hezbollah is deployed all over the borderline. Look, throughout the years since the previous war in 2006, Hezbollah was deployed in, there are many, many towns here. Again, I took a simple map. There are many, many towns here, Shiite towns. And Hezbollah was deployed military inside the homes, inside the civilian infrastructure of the Shiite towns and made a, an effort to make sure that uh, the UN forces there will not, will not be capable of revealing its military deployment. In the past two years, there is no shame anymore. Hezbollah established military positions all across the borderline, more than 20 military positions. His military operatives were deployed all across the borderline with uh, watching on top of the watching towers uh, all across the borderline. And there were, uh, I'm looking for another map now. And they were watching us. We were watching them. They were watching us. And I want to show you a photo uh, that I took from the border. Mm -hmm. And I have plenty of these uh, of a Hezbollah military operative watching me. At first, they were. Zoom is making me troubles. <laughs> mm -hmm. At first they were, uh, you know, I have two screens usually, but now I am in the shelter, so we didn't have the time to connect another screen and everything was very uh, tense. Totally, totally understand, Sarit, and thank you. So this is the Hezbollah military operative. I ah. guess you can see him with a camera taking yeah. photos of me. I'm taking photos of him. He's standing just behind the wall. And you know where he's standing on the border? He's standing next to a Hezbollah tunnel, underground border crossing tunnel that was revealed. IDF exposed the six of these a few years ago. And the plan of Hezbollah was, 
like what Hamas did in the south, the plan was to do the same in the north, but coming from tunnels. And IDF blocked the tunnels. And since IDF blocked the tunnels and it neutralized the capability to come with the hundreds or thousands of uh, soldiers from the tunnels, there were constant clashes and there were the building of these watching towers and uh, the old borderline just changed. And uh, more than a year ago, we in Alma Center uh, pointed that Hezbollah is interested in escalation on the borderline, maybe in, even in war. Actually, we described the scenario that happened in the South. We thought it will be from the North. What I'm trying to say is that the capabilities that you saw of Hamas, everything exists in Lebanon in the hands of Hezbollah and 10 times more. The arsenal of rockets of Hamas, comparing to Hezbollah, Hezbollah has 10 times more rockets than the arsenal of, uh, of Hamas. Trying to find the numbers. Uh, these are the numbers. Uh, 145 rockets is small shells of them. Can you, you share can that? That's a, that's a slide. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> 145,000 rockets uh, are mortars. Uh, they get to a range of uh, 20 kilometers. 65,000 rockets that can get to a range of around 200 kilometers, maybe less. Uh, 5,000 are can get rockets to <clears throat> wider range. 2,000 drones, by the way, not only suicide drones, including in the hands of Hamas. It's suicide drones and attacking drones. We've seen, we have videos of Hamas. Maybe later I'll show you that you can see that they attack the watching towers in Israel, our scouts. They attack them with the attacking drones. They published the video. Uh, and hundreds, a few hundreds probably of uh, advanced weapons, including uh, PGMs, precision guided missiles that can carry out attacks against all Israeli civilian infrastructure. Why am I saying that? Because Nasrallah promised he would do so. As simple as that, he presented the map a few years ago and he said, these are the infrastructures in Israel and I can, I have missiles that can get there. Right, so you just mentioned, you. I think I heard you say that Assad uh, said that he would do that. Nasrallah, Assad uh, is not uh, Nasrallah. an issue. Okay, you said Nasrallah, because I do want to touch on, uh, you mentioned before, Lebanon and Syria. Uh, I, I'm getting to that. Okay, can I I'm pause just one second? I understand we're going to lose Mike in a few minutes, Mike Wagenheim, um, who's got to go to uh, uh, another session. So, um, Mike, if you're there and you're off mute, I do want to uh, ask you lots of things, but one in particular, if you can shed some light on the... Uh, the unity government, the nature of the unity government, uh, while we have you, if you are uh, up on that. Um, uh, but uh, let me hand it over to you. To the extent we know anything about it at this point. Okay, Mike is, I have to, he's muted. So, um... There he is. Trying to help him out. Is he there? He is there. I'm mean, well. It says he's muted. Let's see. Ask to unmute. Anyway. Okay. You got me now. You got your mic. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay. So to your question, uh, Danny, uh, promising developments certainly uh, based on well, based on um, what we have, um, you know, the internal tensions that we've been experiencing um, in Israel for uh, uh, nearly a, a year now. That the fact that uh, the unity government was um, formed today. It's it's narrow. It's not a broad swath of um, the political spectrum like we saw in the unity government uh, in the uh, the Bennett Lapid days. Uh, this will be very narrowly tailored and only meant to address uh, the war situation. Uh, there will be no bills that can be advanced uh, through the Knesset other than to deal with the war and related issues. That means judicial reform is on hold for the time being, along with a lot of other things that were making their way through the Knesset. Um, and it will be essentially a three-man uh, war operation between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Defense Minister Gallant, and now former Defense Minister uh, Benny Gantz, who's uh, the head of the opposition of National Unity Party. So th this is th this is not um, something 
um, that is going to be a whole of government approach. Uh, it's not a turning of the tide in terms of Israeli politics. It is simply uh, a necessary element for the war to display unity. And, and while the, um, the government might not say so, it's to make sure that the most responsible people are in the room. There was fear not only from the opposition, but within the government as well, that there were too many unexperienced and oftentimes um, potentially explosive elements uh, making national security decisions. This will be a narrowly tailored um, a group of experienced people, whether you agree with them politically or not. They've managed mm -hmm. wars before, all three of them. Uh, and so this is what it's tailored to do is simply to manage the war effort over the coming days, weeks, months, what have you. This is going to be a long, hard experience. And, and we have uh, we being Israel have experienced people now uh, in the room managing that effort. So, uh, so have any portfolios, have any cabinet positions changed, or what's the nature of the power sharing? What, what, what is? Uh, I'm not a hundred percent getting it, unless I'm being thick. You're not being thick at all. This is uh, this doesn't happen very often where you bring uh, people from the opposition into the room to manage this effort. This has nothing to do with ministerial rules uh, roles whatsoever. There, there was no political deal on the table that now the National Unity Party uh, gets to um, have uh, various ministerial roles. It, it has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It is simply narrowly tailored to manage the war operations itself. Benny Gantz does not become defense minister. That remains in the hands of Yoav Gallant. He doesn't have any official title that, that I know of. Uh, it, and, and there are going to be two observers from the opposition that were brought in as well. Uh, uh, Gideon Saar and uh, Gaidi Eisenkot, another uh, former IDF chief of staff, who will serve as observers in the room and lend their experience uh, to the war effort as well. This has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day operations of the government itself. The ministers that have been running their various portfolios, whether it be finance, education, tourism, what have you, will continue to manage those roles. It is simply and has to do with nothing else other than to make sure that there is a, uh, an experience a group of people in the room running the war effort, and that it is a signal that whatever decisions are made are made irrespective of uh, political, personal political imperatives, that this is now representative of a wider swath of Israeli society. You have both government and opposition in the room together making those decisions, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, gives um, a, a little bit of, of relief uh, to some in the opposition who are saying, hey, we, we want to be a part of this, but we can't do it unless we're actually in the room making those decisions. I, I think that's a, a bit of a relief now for many in the opposition, many who support uh, the Israeli opposition that, OK, this is going to be now um, a, a properly managed uh, um, uh, portfolio, pro properly managed military effort. And it's going to be done irregardless of the uh, the political pressures of the day, of the personal uh, political uh, um, um, needs of the day, as, as we've seen with other elements of the government that has caused so much uh, consternation and heartache in Israeli uh, society over these last few months. Understood. Understood. Okay. Extremely helpful, Mike. And I know if you have to run, go ahead. I, I do want to turn back to Sarit and make sure we, we uh, address um, the Okay. Negative. Just to finish uh, my point uh, to your question about uh, what is Lebanon, and then I believe that I will have to leave as well. Yes, sure. Uh, because uh, in Israel now it's almost uh, 11 p.m. and I hardly got uh, sleep in the past few days. Um, so I just want to present um, an, a, something that will answer your question about Lebanon versus uh, terrorist organizations. Uh, and I want to explain what I mean. Guys, the campaign that you see that is happening now against the state of Israel was an uh, architect, was organized, was well planned in advance uh, by Iran itself. This is not Hamas against the state of Israel or Hezbollah against the state of Israel or both of them. No, it's not. This is a campaign that the Iranians planned and they just uh, gave the mission to the operational mission uh, to their proxies. And why am I showing you this slide when I'm saying that? Because what Iran had done in the past decade is building these proxies everywhere in the Middle East, in all these countries that you see in the slide. Uh, they took mm -hmm. advantage of the civil 
war in Syria and the civil war in Yemen. They fueled the civil war in Yemen. And they ended up in a situation that they have proxies all over. This slide is based not on research. This slide is based on an Iranian video named Joint Operation Room. There is no joint operation, okay? That they showed the vision, what they want to achieve symbolically. And they showed that they have all these proxies. We took, you know, the symbols on the patches on their shoulder and we just put everything in one slide. And we analyzed from where they are coming. And they said, we have a joint operation room to attack the state of Israel and liberate Jerusalem. This is the mission, okay? Now, the idea was to create a situation that Hamas will attack us in the south and PIJ. Hezbollah probably has the mission to attack us from the north, but probably in a different way, not as we've seen in Yom Kippur, two sides at the same time, probably in a different way. And, uh, and at the same time, I do see Hamas calling uh, the Palestinians in West Bank to also join in. I do see uh, misinformation, fake news, whatever you want to say in social media to try to inflame the situation between Jews and Arabs based on, on completely fake information inside Israel. And I believe it's the Iranians behind it with their bots. And I do see escalation on my northern border where Israel had done nothing to bring this escalation on the northern border. And what I also saw is that there was a, a series of meetings between August 12th to September 2nd between Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, Iran, and PIJ, that if you analyze on a timeline the meetings, who met with who and when, you understand that this was the approval of this plan. And so, so Lebanese so state doesn't exist to your question, Danny. The yeah. Lebanese state doesn't exist. There is Hezbollah, and I don't, I don't use the word control because it's not exactly control. There is Hezbollah that has, that is the strongest player in Lebanon, that actually uh, uh, controls areas of Lebanon. This is the more accurate uh, term, and that is entrenched into the government of Lebanon. It's a member of the parliament and the government of Lebanon. While well, there is no president at office for more for a year now. And Lebanon is not a state. It's a failed state. The same as Syria is a failed state. The same as Yemen is a failed state. The same as uh, Iraq is a failed state. And that's why it was so easy to Iran to take over these countries and to do what it is doing now. And my closing message, I'm sorry, I just have to leave. My yes. closing message to you, brothers and sisters in Westchester, is that if we will not fight this and we will you know, contain and keep the Northern Arena uh, limited and, you know, everything will be fine and we will continue to live under the threat of, as you've seen in my slides, almost 200,000, around 200,000 missiles and drones and whatever. Everything that happened in Gaza will happen again. In Gaza again, in the North, the amount of casualties, everything will happen again. What my lesson as, as an ex-officer in the army is that the Israeli strategy of deterrence and a containers and the fact that we can live with the capabilities of a, a terrorist organizations on our borders, no, we can't. This ended now. And now we have to fight that and make sure that my children will be secure, not only when the IDF is full-scale recruited, but also in times of routine, because there is no routine in Israel. I know you have to leave, but it sounds like you are portending uh, a, uh, indeed, a multi-front, uh, long, drawn-out uh, war uh, or series of, of wars that go on for a while. Uh, hopefully not, um, but um, that was a very clear statement about uh, yesterday's strategy has to be thrown out and torn up, and it's a whole new day. Thank you for having me. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, I do want to, on that note, turn uh, to 
Dr. Kodish. And, um, you know, in all fairness, we perhaps should have started with you because you, uh, you dealt with this from the second it began Saturday morning. And uh, I think we all want to thank everybody who's been on the call, but we want to thank you and your entire staff for the long hours and the difficulty that you have had to deal with since Saturday. And uh, I'm just gonna turn it over to you to tell us what those first few hours and day was like, um, what you do at Soroka uh, and how things are going. Uh, thank, you, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I also have family living in Westchester County, so um, or in your area, so I feel uh, somewhat connected. I've been to synagogue. I've been to synagogue, and I think uh, something with Kisco is the name, or oh, sorry, I should have looked it up before getting out the call. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I have a cousin who lives in Katona. Um, let me let me tell you a little bit about Soroka before I start. Let's see if I can get this shared correctly. I guess I need to do this. Let's see. So is this is hmm. editing? Yeah, we see it. Okay, I'm trying to get it in full screen mode. Ah. There we go. Okay, so let me just very briefly tell you about Soroka. Soroka is one of Israel's uh, uh, tertiary medical care centers. We have six. We're the only one in southern Israel. And as you can see from the map of Israel, we care for about 60% of the area of Israel. It also means we're the primary and only tertiary medical care area serving for the entire area we've been discussing uh, for almost the past area. Um, and I'm really not going to spend too much time. This is this is what we look like. A fairly large campus, uh, originally designed uh, to be outside of the city. Um, and now we're sort of dead in the center. And in some other opportunity, if I get a chance to tell you more about Zolka, I'd love to do so. So let me go back to Shabbat. So Shabbat morning, around 6.45, um, rockets started going off in Beersheba. Uh, air raid sirens started going off in Beersheba. Um, and this is very unusual. There was no no clue that anything like this was going to happen. But we we were familiar with random acts of uh, people in Gaza deciding that it's a good idea to lob rockets into Israel. At about 7.15, we realized this was mo far more frequent than we're used to. And I asked for all management to start traveling to the hospital. Uh, and we set a meeting for 7.45. On the way to the hospital, three air raid rockets, air raid sirens went off. Um, and again, we sort of drove through them as, as we heard rockets falling around us. Uh, eight, certainly atypical. And as a result of that, we did something that required, um, I'm not really sure how we had the guts to do it, but we, de we declared a mass casualty event at 8 a.m. Uh, when we had six casualties in our ED. And the reason we did this is we had no idea what was going on, but we knew this was Shabbat. People were at home, people were abroad. We didn't really have a good idea of who was around and what kind of forces we could mobilize later in the day. We knew we needed to move many sites that weren't protected into other sites. Um, and we simply brought everyone in. By 9 a.m., we had 300 caregivers in the hospital. Um, when we only had about 20 to 30 patients in our ED. By 10, all our operating rooms were operating and we were calling the Ministry of Health and saying, listen, we can't take any more casualties. But there was no one else available to either move patients or accept them. So they just kept, kept pouring in. Um, so we're sort of working on three fronts at the same time. One is making the hospital empty. We sent 100 patients home on Shabbat morning, uh, mobilizing whatever ambulances were around, around Beersheba and just saying, you know, we need the beds now. We don't know how far and how wide this is going to be. We realize this is a very big event. The second one is we make sure our staff can make it in. Um, many of our, our staff lives to the west of us, um, expecting an operating room nurse to leave her children at home in Ofakim <laughs> is not something that's going to happen under this scenario. And we need to figure out who we bring in and what kind of forces we have available. And Can I ask you protect... also, uh, Dr. Kodish, how far is the drive to Soroka from, say, you know, Reim or Sderot or? 
about 40 minutes. Well, okay, okay. It's, uh, it's um, of course, during this time, no one could come in from those areas. It's, it's not even something that could be considered. We're talking about people a little closer to us. Okay. By 6 p.m., I'm gonna make this shorter. By 6 p.m., uh, we had admitted 600 patients. Um, the largest number we've ever admitted in one day of hostilities was less than 100. So sort of to give a, a proportion. Um, at this point, we had people pouring in from other hospitals at our request. Um, we had nurses coming in from Haifa, Haemek, in Afula, hmm. um, Meir, Petah Tikva area. Um, again, at our request, 50 medical students came in and were being used as orderlies just moving patients around. We've mobilized equipment. So our PET CT was being used as a regular CT because we need CT scans. And again, um, by the time the day ended, we were nearing 700 patients. 120 of them were cared for in our trauma unit. Um, and this really is a number no one had imagined we would ever need to care for or succeed to care for. Uh, but uh, there simply was no choice. They were pouring in with dozens of ambulances, helicopters, and so on. Just um, let's see if I can go in the right direction. Just mm -hmm. some pictures. We really didn't have anyone available to take pictures. By evening, we had 30 such stretchers. I don't know if you can see this stretcher here, um, covered in blood, uh, brought in by soldiers. Um, the ambulances had to leave so fast to pick up more casualties. They just threw the stretchers at our entrance, picked up other stretchers that we made available for them, um, and we just had piled up stretchers. And you can see uh, patients uh, evacuated by civilians, by soldiers, by helicopters. Um, and you could also see the large number of people we had ready to care for people, the people in purple, green, blue, varying by the units they came from. Um, at some point, our trauma unit that had six beds was caring for 12 people at, at any given time. So double the number it's built for. Um, I'm wondering how much time can I, I have. Can I? Um, well, I'll, I'll, don't worry about that. I'll I'll manage that. But let me just ask you: uh, of the numbers of wounded, which I guess we have heard in the thousands, um, so what percentage of the wounded though ha have gone through the doors of Soroka? It sounds like a big percentage. I mean, ha half or more? A little less. A little less than half. Okay, and I um, wanted to there's ask a lot you, of this. Uh, of the nature yeah, of the ahead. of the nature of the injuries you saw, this is this is going to sound a bit morbid, and I apologize to everybody. But um, you know, we're already up over twelve hundred dead. Uh, of the nature of the injuries, uh, you know, is there a sense in your mind of what number of the critically wounded are going to be able to make it? Uh, hopefully, a very very large number, but. You know, I, I have no context for that. So what, what was really horrible about this specific event is we saw, I would say the, the majority of, of injured people we saw had gunshot wounds. Now, we're, we're no strangers to gunshot wounds. And what you would see is one gunshot wound, uh, you know, either intentional or unintentional. You'll see soldiers who wore protective vests. So the gunshot wound is not as impactful. When you see young people, civilians coming in with six gunshot wounds to the torso, to the head, to the limbs, um, these are very, very severe, hard, and life-threatening injuries. Of um, of the number of patients who came in, we had um, 18 patients expire in our ED. We've right. had uh, two or three expire since, and everyone else is now, you know, it has a very long road. To recover, we probably will recover. So the vast majority of people who made it to a tertiary medical care center and received, you know, rapid, as rapid as possible, some received it later, um, will recover. The damages will be far worse because of the long time it took people to reach us. Mm -hmm. People, it sometimes took hours for people to make it to the hospital. Uh, because I of the ability. Minute, uh, I, I want to give you a minute to acknowledge um your your staff and tell everybody what you told me about some of your nurses, some of your doctors that are um, uh, not at the hospital now. So 
when when this is true for every event we have, when we have a, a escalation with Gaza and people have to come in under rocket attacks, it's always tricky to push the button and say, you know, everyone leave your homes now, leave your young kids behind or spouses um, and drive through air raid sirens. Um, the uh, everyone came, like everyone who could, everyone whose roads weren't blocked, came. They came very fast. They came from Haifa. They came from the Golan Heights where they were on vacations. Um, we were not amazingly. We were not short for staff. We were short for equipment. We were short for emergency uh, surgical theaters. Um, but the staff was there, and I think these sort of pictures can can create this. Um, you can get this feeling across. People stayed in the hospital for about 36 hours, myself included, of course. You know, working ceases, ceases it at around midnight and Shabbat. I started looking for people to man the night shift. And I sort of walked up to Zaki, who's a, um, the head of pediatric surgery. And I said, you know, would you take the night shift? Because I didn't see him earlier. And he said, sure, I will. And then someone whispered in my ear, he's been here since, since AM, 8 a.m. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing anyone any favors. So I said, you know, don't. And and you almost killed me. <laughs> it was not uh <laughs> so really um our staff uh, is the key to all of this, all of this working. I mean, for the past few days, uh, my colleagues have been asking how could how could anyone hospital possibly do this? And and the answer really is uh, the tremendous dedication of our staff. Um I'll, I'll, I I want to share one specific so so these are just some pictures of our helicopter pad during various times of uh, of this event, um, but I want to I want to show this picture a bit. Uh, this is a picture our American friends of Soroka, and uh, uh, cry out to Rachel and Rachel who are I think I saw them in the attendance. Uh, this was posted on uh, probably Motzei Shabbat on our website, uh, just as a picture of people carrying you know during the trauma unit. This is a uh, Young Bedouin boy, eight years old, who was who had a gunshot wound to his abdomen. His father was killed uh, in the fields outside of Netivot. Um, and this is just a team caring for this. this. is a much less hectic photo than the ones you saw on the previous slide, because as you can see, it's 9 a.m. You know, this is these are the early hours of this event. And this is Dr. Eitan Neiman, um, who was there the whole day. At 2 p.m., Dr. Neiman received what we call a Tzav Shmone, uh, urgent military call. And we told him, you're not going. And I received within an hour approval from the director of the Ministry of Health to not let him go because he's a pediatric intensive care guy and we really need him in the hospital, but he disappeared. He went to the army anyway, and he was killed in action the next day. Yeah. Um, and uh, I attended his funeral today, uh, six young children, um, and you, you know, will forever live in our memories as Major Dr. Eitan Neiman. Um, and part of our response team, we have, um, because we're located in this area, we have many staff members who were affected uh, with first degree relatives killed. Uh, we now have two doctors and one nurse who were killed. We have a doctor who, uh, who left his family in Beiri locked in a shelter to go work in the clinic where patients might need. The clinic was one of the first places that terrorists came in and just killed everyone in the clinic. So Dr. Daniel Levy of blessed memory as well. Um, so part of our struggle is not only equipment and working and staffing and so on, we have a hospital to heal as well as the rest of the population does. And um, last night when I went to the pediatric in intensive care unit, one of the, you know, where Dr. Neyman worked one of the nurses asked me if he can talk to me quietly on the side. And I said, sure, an Arab nurse. And he said, I wanna make sure you don't think for a minute that we need any discounts. We'll care for everyone. Everyone's ready to work, we'll grieve later. So this is sort of what the staff we have and the reason we're gonna win this and the reason we're gonna overcome is that this is the type of people we have, you know, working on this event. Um, and sort of a, a, quick, a quick shift these are our staff children, 150 of whom come every day to the oh, hospital to get nice. daycare. Because if I want their mothers and fathers to be able to come and work, so we provide daycare and we have ha a little happiness, um, you know, within the hospital during all of this. And just because I'm looking at the clock and my cuckoo just went off, yeah. uh, if any this is of interest to any of our attendees, so please.
take a screenshot of this. Uh, we're very nearby to you. Um, and Rachel uh, Heisler Schenfeld, who is our director, will be happy to provide any other information uh, you may want about Soroka and what we do. Thank you, doctor. And we're gonna go over just a, a minute or two. Uh, so we're not gonna shut this down instantaneously. I do wanna turn back to you, Mike Lyons. Um, I know you're on mute right now. Uh, I do see there are a lot of great questions. And honestly, as I've read them, uh, it, it seems to me that we're not entirely uh, equipped to answer some of these uh, truly um, well articulated uh, questions. And I think it just means that we're going to have to do some important uh, follow up. But I, I do want to ask you, um, Mike, as um, you know, somebody who's been around war, uh, who knows Israel, uh, and um, you know, who's obviously spent a lot of time focusing on this particular uh, last several days. Um, just so maybe if you can wrap up for us uh, in your own words, uh, how how you see this playing out. Um, and then I will uh, bring things to a close for today in any event. Well, I, I, you know, this is going to end in victory for Israel. It's just what does that look like? Um, I think in, that uh, the situation in the south in Gaza is a diff very difficult situation from a military perspective, because given the population, given what's going on there, given all the capability that Israel could bring to the table. But um, but then the threat that still re remains in the north and to what uh, your colleague we talked about, uh, this is not going away. So the question is, will Israel, now that they've declared war and, and if the, as things go, will this, will this be used in order to try to solve a lot of problems and be ready to, to do what has to be done? It might mean uh, other things. It might mean going after enemy in different places. If there's any time Israel needs allies, it's right now. Uh, if uh, could you imagine if an Arab state stood up uh, and actually not in just word but indeed uh, did something? But um, from a military perspective, I'd like to see them continue to pause and and use their indirect fire, protect their own forces, work the hostages as best they can. Uh, look to deploy reserves to that northern border, as has been told here today about that threat. Uh, and I think we're in for a very long road. Well, Mike, uh, thank you as always for your um, being on point and honest and straightforward. Um, I do want to make a point of noting that we have viewers and listeners here from not only all over the United States, but uh, all over the world in Israel. And we have individuals whose immediate family members are um, indeed uh, protecting all of us on this call uh, who are serving in the south and in the north. I know you know who you are. I see you on the screen. I thank you. Um, and um, we will continue this to educate and make sure that we get the word out. Uh, Mike, as always, thank you very much. We're all looking forward, unfortunately, to hearing you explain things uh, on our TV screens as well. So pay attention when you uh, hear Major Mike Lyon's name called out. And uh, I thank you all. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna conclude today as um, as we began. Uh, I will say with um, as as many of you know, I'm fond of uh, Shlomo Artsy, but we're gonna conclude now with uh, uh, another song of of his uh, called uh, Imagine for yourselves. Imagine a beautiful world, less sad than what it is. And we walk in it with sunshine in our pockets and above the rooftops, only stars as time passes by without fear. It'll run for about a minute. Thank you. We're gonna actually have to play the right side. <laughs> ותאו לכם עולם יפה, פחות עצוב ממשהו ככה. ואנחנו שם הולכים עם שמש בכיסים, ומלגגות הכוכבים, 
והזמן עובר בלי פחד, ואני הולך לפגוש אותה בגן הילדים. תתארו לכם קצת אושר, כי הוא כל כך, כל כך נדיר כאן, עיר מגניבה בתוך החושך, ושנינו בשמיכה, ואם לתת את אותי, ואומרת לי, מחר יקרה מה שרצית, ואם לאט השתקפויות של עצר. ‫אין שמחה. ‫-כן, ירדן. ‫היי. ‫תודה. ‫-תודה. ‫-תודה. ‫-תודה.